Welcome to this lecture. This is the fourth lecture of week 2. In this week, we have so far seen the construction of product measure and we have also discussed several applications of Fubini's theorem which leads to certain very nice applications of the product measure results that we have discussed so far. In particular, we have also discussed certain important inequalities involving convergences of series and finiteness of certain moments of random variables. All of those appeared as applications of Fubini's theorem. Now, we are going to see certain interesting connection of product measures with independence of random variables. Without further delay, let us move on to the slides and discuss the material of this lecture. We first recall these very basic concepts that you have seen in your basic probability course. We start off with this independence of two events and then we will talk about independence of random variables. So, throughout we follow the notation that omega fp stands for a probability space. This is arbitrary but fixed and all the random variables that we consider in this lecture will be defined in this probability space. Let us start by recalling this definition of independence of two events. So, two events let us call them C and D. They are of course, elements of the collection script F. They are said to be independent if they satisfy this relation that probability of C intersection D is the product of the individual probabilities. But now, you know that as a consequence of this relation, you have this very nice consequences that if you look at the intersection of the set C with the complement of D, this can be written as subtraction of probability of C minus probability of C intersection D. Now, C intersection D since C and D are given to be independent, you can write it as the product of the individual probabilities. Now, do this bit of algebra and simplification, you will be able to write it as probability of C times 1 minus probability of D. Now, this you can rewrite using probability of D complement. Then again, this gives you the independence of the set C and D complement. Therefore, by assuming C and D are independent, you have proved that C and D complement are independent. And using similar arguments, you can extend these ideas to other combinations like C complement and D and even both complemented meaning C complement and D complement. So, both these pairs must be independent if C and D are given to be independent. But now, using this notion of independence of events, you can extend this to the idea of independence of two random variables. The definition should again be familiar to you, but we rewrite using the notation of measure theory. We start with two random variables x and y, again defined on this given probability space. And if you want to say that they are independent, you have to assume this condition that for all sets A and B coming from the Borel sigma field, these events x inverse A and y inverse B must be independent. But now let us rewrite the definitions of the pre images. It is exactly the set of points such that x of omega falls in A. And we understand this shorthand notation by suppressing the symbol small omega we end up with this shorthand notation for this pre-image which is the event capital X belongs to A. Similarly, the pre-image Y inverse B can be similarly written in the shorthand notation in terms of the event Y belongs to B. Now, the independence of X and Y is defined through the independence of these events X in A and Y in B and therefore, what you want is this relation to be satisfied for all pairs of sets A and B coming from the Borel sigma field of R. But then again you can rewrite using your familiar notation in terms of events x in A and y in B. So, the probability of that is essentially the product of the probabilities of the individual events. So, this is a definition should be familiar to you, but we have now used the notations of measure theory and pre images of sets to write this definition once more. But then again this definition actually leads to some nice connection with product measure as we will discuss now. 
So continue with this definition that we have just talked about. But now look at the measurability structures of the functions x and y. So these are defined on this probability spaces omega fp and on the range side you have the induced probability measures. Coming from x you have the induced probability measure p compose x inverse. Coming from y you get the induced probability measure p compose y inverse. But then once you have these probability measures you note that these are exactly the law of these random variables x and y respectively. But then again you can look at these random variables jointly and that leads you to the random vector which is taking values in R2. So this is a two dimensional random vector. So for each point small omega you are actually looking at the value x of omega y of omega. So that is the description of the random vector. But then again once you know the measurability of the individual components x and y separately you have the measurability of the random vector x comma y and now you can talk about the law of this random vector which is now a probability measure on R2 together with the Burel sigma field on R2 which we typically denote by p compose this inverse. So now let us look at the definition of independence of the random variables x and y. Here what we know is that we have to look at probability of this intersection of the sets as product of the individual probabilities. But this should be true for arbitrarily a and b in the Borel sigma field. Now the domain side set that appears here that you can rewrite using the pre image of this joint random vector and you have to look at the product type set a cross b. Here you simply note that for any point to belong to this pre image of pre image under the random vector all you have to have is by definition that x of omega comma y of omega so that pair should be in the product a cross b but that is equivalent to that x of omega belongs to a and y of omega belongs to b. So that is exactly what we are rewriting here. So the initial intersection of the pre images in terms of the pre images of a under x and pre image of b under y that intersection can be written in terms of this random vectors pre image that is as a pre image through this random vector. Now we have rewritten the left hand side and we are keeping the right hand side unchanged. But then in the next step we recall that p compose x y inverse that is the law of the random vector. On the right hand side we can bring in the laws of the individual random variables x and y. So therefore you get this probability measures p compose x inverse and p compose y inverse. The right hand side is in terms of the laws of the individual random variables. But then again this relation holds for arbitrary a and b coming from the Borel sigma field and on the, on the left hand side you have the product type set and therefore you are led to the identification of the product measure. So the left hand side is a two dimensional measure defined on the product sigma field and on the right hand side you essentially end up having the product measure of p compose x inverse and p compose y inverse. So this essentially identifies that so the joint law is the product measure of the marginal laws. Now this is a revisit or restatement of the independence of the two random variables. We, what we have seen is the independence of x and y we can rewrite using the several equivalent formulations and this finishes with the identification of the law the joint law through the product measure of the marginal laws. But then again you can rewrite using very special product type sets. You see that we can look at the intervals of the form a b c d which are left open right closed. These generate the Borel sigma field. So essentially if you have the relation on this product type sets for this rectangles then this relation holds. So therefore you have this equivalence here. Now once you have this equivalence follow this equivalence for other types of generating sets. So you can use this ray type intervals so one, one side is minus infinity another side is enclosed and then again since this type of sets also generate the relevant sigma fields you end up with this relation and 
this is again a equivalent condition. But then again this final condition can be written in terms of the relation between the distribution functions. On the left hand side you have the joint distribution function of the random vector x y. On the right hand side you have the product of the marginals distribution functions meaning the distribution functions of the random variables x and y separately. But you see this is how we typically define the independence of the random variables and this again leads us back to the results in our basic probability theory courses. So, what we have essentially connected is that we have gone back to the basic results in basic probability theory in terms of independence of random variables. We have however, been able to connect that the independence essentially means that the joint law is the product of the marginal laws. The product is in the sense of product measure that we have been discussing in this week. All right. So, now we can also in consider some several special cases. If x and y both are discrete or both are absolutely continuous, then you can describe the laws of these random variables in terms of the probability mass function or the probability density functions. And therefore, you can in fact rewrite the equivalence conditions through these probability mass functions and the probability density functions as the case appear to be. But then we have so far discussed notions of independence of two events and then extended it to independence of two random variables. Let us consider multiple events and then multiple random variables. We start with the fact that we will again continue the discussions on the same probability space. So, whatever events or random variables that we are considering all of them are coming from the same probability space. So, let us recall this important definition. We have the independence of two collection of events and this is given by the following definition. So, consider these two collections one indexed by lambda another indexed by gamma. So, the sets coming from the first collection are denoted as C alpha other ones are denoted by d beta. We have two distinct collections, but all these events that we are considering come from the same probability space. We say that these two collections are independent. If pairwise you take one element from each of the collections, meaning you choose one index from each of the indexing sets, you get these sets C alpha and d beta, then C alpha and d beta must be independent. So, if this happens for all possible alpha and beta, then you say the collections separately are independent of each other. Now, you can use this concept of independence of two collections to connect it with again the independence of two random variables. Here we first recall that given a random variable x, we can look at all the pre images under that random variable that gives you a collection of subsets of omega each of which are events. So, this is a collection of events, but then again you can see that this collection of events on their own form a sub sigma field of the grand sigma field on the domain side. And this is what we typically denote by sigma of x. So, this involves all the information about the underlying random variable capital X. Now, if you use this earlier definition, we can restate the independence of two random variables through independence of the two collections sigma x and sigma y. Here all you have to remember is that x and y are independent if and only if x inverse of a and y inverse of b these two sets must be independent for all choices of sets a and b coming from the Borel sigma field. That is essentially rewriting the definition of the independence of the two collections of events sigma x and sigma y. So, therefore, we have essentially rewritten the independence of two random variables in various formats one through the joint law in terms of the product of the marginal laws and in another format through the independence of the underlying sigma fields. We are now going to extend this uh, definitions to multiple events and multiple random variables. So, let us start with the cases involving an arbitrary number of events and here we introduce this term called mutual independence. So, we start with this arbitrary collection, but indexed by a collection lambda. Here we denote the individual sets as C alpha. 
Here we say that this collection of events are mutually independent. If you choose any finite sub collection c alpha 1 up to c alpha k where k is some uh, non-negative integer greater or equal to 2, you have to justify that this relation should be true meaning that for any finite sub collection c alpha 1 up to c alpha k probability of the intersection of these events is the product of the individual probabilities. So, if this relation holds for all k and all finite such sub collections then you say that the events that you consider this arbitrary collection are mutually independent. Now, uh, this mutual independence that we are considering here we have defined in terms of a arbitrary collection, but you can reduce it consider it as a special case where you only have a finite number of events. So, suppose you have originally started off with finite number of events c1 up to ck, then the special case of this definition requires us to look at these many conditions. So, where you have these distinct indices i1 up to im where each of which are heading between i1 up to, I, uh, up to k and these numbers m is also up to k. Now, here what we are considering is that we have to look at this m many choices out of k many choices, but this must happen for all such choices of m from 2 to k and therefore, you end up having the number of conditions being m choose 2 sorry k choose 2 plus k choose 3 up to k choose k, but you can rewrite using the binomial theorem it as 2 power k minus k minus 1 simply being 1 plus 1 raised to the power k minus k choose 1 minus k choose 0 that is what it gives you the relation 2 power k minus k minus 1. So, for checking the mutual independence for k events you require these many conditions which is 2 power k minus k minus 1. But then again there is a relevant condition called pairwise independence. So, let us look at this. So, we continue with that same notation that we consider a arbitrary collection of sets C alpha indexed by this uh, set lambda. Then we say that this collection of events are pairwise independent if for all distinct indices alpha and beta the corresponding sets C alpha and C beta are independent. If this happens for all such choices of distinct pairs alpha and beta, then we say this collection of events are pairwise independent. Now, you see that for two events the notion of mutual independence that we have discussed earlier and the pairwise independence which we are discussing now they coincide if you are having two events. But more generally what we will typically have is that mutual independence will imply the pairwise independence, but not the other direction. So, you will be having in the converse direction in general the result not being true meaning in general pairwise independence will not imply mutual independence. For a justification of this please note that even for a finite number of events if you consider c1 up to ck then for pairwise independence all you require are k choose 2 conditions meaning for every pair of symbols alpha and beta you require the corresponding events to be independent. So, therefore, in total there are k choose 2 conditions which is far far less than 2 power k minus k minus 1 that number. So, this essentially already hints to the fact that mutual independence requires many more conditions and therefore, it is a stronger condition than pairwise independence. Now, you can extend the ideas that we have observed for two events to this finitely many events. So, remember that we have shown earlier that if two events are independent then their complements are also independent of each other. You can repeat that for finitely many events again if you have c1 up to ck are given to be independent then their complementary events are also independent. So, please take this as an exercise and verify this. Now, let us move on to discussing the independence of random variables where we are now going to consider three or more random variables. Okay. So, let us look at the mutual independence of a finite number of random variables. So, we say a finite number of random variables x1 up to xk are mutually independent or simply independent if this relation holds that you look at pre-images under each of these random variables, look at the intersection. 
so that gives you the probability that is appearing on the left hand side. On the right hand side, you look at individual probabilities of the individual pre images and look at the product of them. If this relation is satisfied for all a1 up to ak in the Borel sigma field, then you say that these finite number of random variables are mutually independent or simply saying that these random variables are independent. This definition should again be familiar to you because if you write it in terms of the usual event notation as appears here, this gives you probability of the events and their product on the right hand side. All right. But now from finite number of random variables, you can extend this definition to arbitrary collections of random variables. So, here you define it in this way that you consider a collection x alpha indexed by this indexing set lambda and this is a collection of random variables all of which are defined on the same probability space. We say that they are mutually independent or simply saying independent if every finite sub collection where your this sub collection is described by x alpha 1 up to x alpha k for all k greater equals to 2 are independent. Meaning you have a general collection then you first choose a natural number k greater equals to 2 look at any finite sub collection of size k which is given by let us say x alpha 1 up to x alpha k. Now appeal to the definition of independence of finite number of random variables verify that condition. If this is true for all such k all such finite sub collections then we say the original collection are made up of independent random variables. Now similar to the case of mutual independence of two collections of events, you can talk about independence of two collections of random variables. And for this what you require is that you have one collection given by x alpha, another collection given by y beta and you want the independence of these two collections through this that every pair coming from the one from the first collection, one from the second collection, one written by x alpha, the other written by y beta, they are independent for all choices of the pairs alpha and beta. If you have it for all choices, then we are going to say that these two collections, one consisting of x alphas, other consisting of y betas are independent of each other. Now let us discuss pairwise independence for random variables. We have discussed this case for events earlier, but now we move on and talk about the similar notion for random variables. We say that a collection of random variables x alpha, so this again this is an arbitrary collection. This collection of random variables are pairwise independent. If any two random variables coming from the collection, let us call them x alpha and x beta for distinct indices alpha and beta are independent. So, you choose arbitrary distinct indices alpha and beta coming from the indexing set corresponding random variables must be independent. If you have it for all pairs alpha and beta for all distinct indices alpha and beta then you say that the collection is pairwise independent. Now again as observed for the case of events even for the case of two random variables the notion of mutual independence and pairwise independence as you can expect they coincide. More generally the mutual independence will always imply the pairwise independence, but in general the converse is not true. So, you can take it as an exercise to find an example of a collection of random variables which is given to be pairwise independent, but not mutually independent. So, please check this that there are such examples where you can find pairwise independence, but not mutual independence. So, what this shows is that mutual independence of random variables is strictly stronger than pairwise independence. Using this concept of independence, we now discuss a partial converse to one of the results that we discussed earlier. Remember, we have earlier discussed this Borel Cantrell lemma first up in the connection with convergences of LP, LP sequences. There applying the borel cantrell lemma, we had obtained that the LP spaces form Banach spaces. But now we are going to see a partial converse to that under the assumptions that the events that we consider are independent. Let us look at the statement. 
we consider a sequence of events a1 a2 an all coming from the same probability space but we consider them to be independent so now here this is a countable collection and for the independence we go back to the definition that we have considered earlier for arbitrary collections now if you have this sequence of independent events and consider this important condition that this probabilities of the events are not summable and they diverge to plus infinity then the conclusion of this result says that limb soup of these events must be with probability 1. So, remember limb soup of a n simply means that the events occur infinitely often. So, this result can also be restated by this form. Now, remember the Borel cantilema first up had the condition that this series that we are considering the series of probabilities is summable. So, in the first half we did not have the independence condition, but under the condition that the probability of these events are summable, you had that the probability of limb soup is 0. So, this is why we consider this as a kind of a partial converse, because we have to have this additional condition of independence. So, let us see the proof. So, here we go back to the definition of limit supremum of the sets A n. So, if you do not recall it, I ask you to revise uh, from your basic probability courses. So, look at the definition of limb soup of a n. What happens is that if you consider this union of the sets a k from m to infinity, this actually decreases to the limb soup as m goes to infinity. But now, you remember that probability measures are actually continuous from above as well as continuous from below. So, if you use the continuous from above property, then the limb soup of the probability of the limb soup as we are considering here will be a limit of the probabilities of these events which are of the form of this summation. But then again in this summation you can again apply the probabilities property that it is continuous from below then using this finite unions and letting L go to infinity you will be able to approximate this probability which is from the probabilities of this union from m to infinity. So, this is where we have used the fact that probability measures are both continuous from above and as well as continuous from below. So, we have used these properties. So, we have this formula or this representation of probability of limb soup in terms of this iterated limits. So, we will come back to this relation start. Now, let us do some computation using the independence. So, so far we have not used the properties of independence. So, look at the this union that appears in the star relation. We will start with the complement of that union. So, we apply this uh, usual properties of the sets. The complementation will transfer the union into intersections of the individual complements. But now observe that since the sets are given to be independent, then their complements are also independent and hence the probability of this intersection can be split as a product of the probabilities of the individual complements. Now, probability of the complement can be written as 1 minus the probability of the original set. So, therefore, you have the this product expression for the expression that we have started off with. But now, here we appeal to a interesting inequality, a easy inequality, which says that for x between 0 and 1, 1 minus x is less or equal to exponential of minus x. If you appeal to this inequality, then each of these terms in the above expression, 1 minus probability of a k is dominated from above by exponential minus probability of a k. And if you take the product in the exponent, it becomes a summation and therefore, you end up with this expression here. So, therefore, the probability of the complement of the union that we are considering in this relation star that that probability has an upper bound given by this exponential of this expression. Now, here we observe first that we have so far not used that the probabilities diverge as a series. 
Now we appeal to that that this series diverges in particular if you look at the sum of terms starting with any number m as l goes to infinity this goes to infinity this is again using the divergence property of the given series. This is true for every fixed m that you choose to work with and hence this exponential term that exponential bound that we have obtained if you let l go to infinity there the exponent inside is minus of that divergent sum to infinity and therefore you conclude that limit l going to infinity of probability of the complement of these unions must be 0. But then again you can rewrite it back in terms of the union original union by complementing on both sides essentially you will say now that the limit of the probability of this union must be 1 but this is true for every fixed m. Now we go back to the representation of probability of limb soup that we have discussed earlier which was this in terms of this iterated limits. Now the inner limit we have managed to show to be 1 but this constant is independent of m and as m goes to infinity you will essentially end up with this constant as the limit once more. And therefore, we have managed to show that the probability of limb soup of a n is 1. So, this is again some nice applications of independence of events and random variables and we finish this lecture with this result. We will see further applications of this results of Borel Cantilly lemma first half and second half in our later discussions. In our later discussions, we will concentrate on sequences of random variables and their convergences. We stop here. Thank you.